All right, let's try something really quick. What the hell? Not Mr. Perfect, but not that bad. Why did I do that? Who knows? Sometimes that's what I say when I watch Raw. Why did I do that? And my concern is now, as the NFL season really gets underway, is that I'm going to start asking myself that question more and more. Why am I doing this? Why am I trying to split back and forth between football and Raw? Why am I watching any of Raw? If this company doesn't care, I don't care. If they're not going to be any good, at least I can watch the Monday night game and track my daily fantasy stuff and pray to God I get a big payout again. Just saying. So, anyways, we get to this week's show. And, of course, you get the little video thing about 9-11. That's neither here nor there to me at this point. I've already said my piece on my personal Twitter about it. And we'll move on from there. But we kick off the show with basically, literally, the same exact first two segments as last week, just in a different order. Instead of it being John Cena wrestling Jason Jordan and beating him, and then Roman Reigns coming out and challenging him in a verbal battle of the ages, this week is Roman Reigns facing off against Jason Jordan, and John Cena is awaiting backstage. John Cena is the one that comes out to him and all this other crap. And one thing I wish is that if you're going to do this crap with Cena and Reigns and talk about one-upsman shit and so on and so forth, why couldn't we let Jason Jordan beat one of these two guys? Why couldn't we let Jason Jordan beat both of these guys? And obviously I'm not talking about clean that's because that's not going to happen. But if you really want to aggravate things between the two parties from a storyline standpoint, if you want to give another reason for these guys to be mad, <clears throat> excuse me, why not have each guy interfere in the other guy's match, cause a distraction, and allow Jason Jordan to get the win? The whole notion of, well, Jason Jordan gets a rub here, Jason Jordan, and by the time all things are said and done, nobody's talking about Jason Jordan. The only reason I'm talking about Jason Jordan is because I'm reviewing the show. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about him at all. And even then... Having him get a victory each over Cena and Reigns in that capacity would be such a natural transition to start to build some type of villain out of this guy by having him talking about, I beat Cena and I beat Reigns. We don't tell a story about what actually happened. He just emphasizes, I beat Cena, I beat Reigns. I'm better than both of these guys. I'm the real top guy in WWE. But nonetheless, that's not what it's about. Jason Jordan was just a pawn. He was just... Uh, a victim for the Breakfast Club, because ultimately, hashtag Breakfast Club rules, bitches. As far as the promo segment between Cena and Reigns, it was by far the worst of the three, um, and it's kind of one of these things that doesn't really matter what I say, is Roman said a couple of good things, and then it was a lot of bland vanilla crap. John Cena said many more things, and a lot more words, and because the WWE, once again, scripted out and structured out this segment in this way to try and give John Cena a bunch of shine and help him look really good because after all these years, we still can't quit him. You get John Cena shooting about failed drug tests. You're not going to be able to pass him and all this other crap. And it's like, give me a damn break. Give me a damn break. You know, to me, so often is the case when you have to work in these work shoot elements beyond a certain point, it speaks to a lack of of depth of char the character, lack of depth of the actual talent. And I'm tired of Cena and his stupid smirky faces. I'm tired of, S tired of Cena always having to position himself in a way where he always gets the one over. And again, just because he says more words doesn't mean they're better or more effective. I can tell you from my own standpoint, there's times I come on here, I've done completely calm, rational voice in videos and brought up some really good points and really feel like I nailed the point home and got the point across and it just doesn't come across that way and people are like it doesn't really get the point it wasn't good but then when I come out and I do the old slug daddy rant and the angry wrestling fan yelling at the cloud the hooting and hollering even if sometimes what I say is total crap even though I believe usually it's not but sometimes it is because I do that more often than not that's viewed better and that's the way I kind of break this all down uh, Emma lost which who Ray who gives a shit Moving on, next, um, Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman come out to say words. 
Uh, and I want to I want to make sure I point this out really quick. As much as everybody wants to hate on both Cena and Reigns, and I understand it, even though I don't fully agree with it, especially on the Reigns component of it. The fact is, is where were they in Anaheim? The arena was like half empty. And last time I checked, the number one program heading into that show is Braun Strowman versus Brock Lesnar. And for all these people all this time, they want to shit on, let's say, a Roman Reigns, but they will defend a Brock Lesnar and talk about the big fight appeal. You know, ultimately, this company pays a shit ton of money for this guy to not draw any fucking money. I'm just going to point that out. If Brock Lesnar was that big of a massive star, if Brock Lesnar was that relevant, if Brock Lesnar mattered that much, I guarantee you the goddamn arena wouldn't be half full. And that was that was what was ridiculous about Roman saying that. Like, who scripts that line talking about ticket sales are just fine when literally all anybody has to do and Cena even had to fight the urge to look over there on the camera side and see that nobody's sitting on that entire side. The upper deck's all taped off. But when does Brock start to get some blame for this? He's the champ. He's the guy. He's the one you associate Heyman with. He's the one you've had the champ since WrestleMania. At what point in time do we start to hold Brock's dick to the fire and say, when are you going to start drawing some fucking money? And that's where, like, when I see Braun Strowman beat up Brock Lesnar and I'm like, hell yeah, fucking beat the brakes off of the sandwich salesman. They really need to just go ahead and give the damn title to Braun because I'm going to tell you quite honestly, the whole plan of having Brock versus Reigns at Mania is dumb. But if you're going to go there, you can always find an excuse to put the belt back on Brock. But what you really need right now is some type of revitalization, a little bit of a jolt in the arm. And Braun beating Brock and getting that title would be just that. And honestly, in the grand scheme of things, if Brock is if Brock isn't drawing, which he's clearly not, Reigns and Cena aren't drawing, which they're clearly not. The worst thing that Braun Strowman's going to do is continue to not draw just like the rest of these fucks at the top. What other risk is there? You're not losing anything. You could potentially gain something from having Brock beat him. Or Braun beat Brock. Probably not going to happen, but be the sensible business thing to do. Another sensible thing, business thing to do would be to end whatever they're doing between Bray Wyatt and Finn Balor immediately. Like this match between Goldust and Bray Wyatt, whatever the fuck it was. We literally now have guys feuding over face paint. Face paint. If face paint is what it takes to prevent Triple H from giving Finn Balor a hot live microphone on Raw, then everybody bring face paint to raw next week and let's all paint your faces okay but my god that's how stupid crap gets in this company today is we are now fighting over face paint and we used to complain about the leprechaun getting pushed more than 95 percent of the roster speaking of getting pushed more than the rest of the roster <clears throat> you know what's going to happen when asuka comes to raw especially amongst the women's division in terms of is Raw the right fit for her? Probably. It is a way to mercifully get us away from having Sasha Banks in every freaking title match, it seems like. Um, how much of a difference is it going to make? I don't know. Does it really matter? I don't know that it does. Because there's a major disconnect between the percentage of the total Raw audience that actually watches NXT on the WWE Network and the vociferousness and the passion that that smaller hardcore segment of the WWE Raw audience that watches the WWE Network with their love for NXT and in particular Asuka. I'm just saying. Let's not, let's not overrate this too much. Let's see what happens when she actually gets to the main roster. Once again, the number one way to get Elias over is to have him sing. And the WWE just can't help but having, whether it's Kalisto or anybody else, interrupt them. You know, the less Elias Russell's right now, the better. Like, you got something there. Why do you keep interrupting one of your interesting acts? I just don't fucking get it. He beats Kalisto, whatever, but that's not how the dude's going to get massively over. Stop putting a guy in a disadvantageous situation when you've clearly got something that works. Fuck, 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 fucking go with it. You continue to go with the Bray Wyatt shit three years to two and a half years past its shelf life and at least two years past a basic level of effectiveness. It's unbelievable. And of course, and of course, because we all know how the Breakfast Club goes, 
when we get to the John Cena versus Braun Strowman match, we know what happens. John Cena ain't putting Braun Strowman over. He might get slammed onto the steps. It might end in a DQ. But John is not putting over Braun Strowman in that way. That just ain't happening right now. It may or may not happen ever. Who knows? Um, it it kind of sucks too because you know when you look at a Cena, it really feels like the WWE is of an opinion that the last time they're ever going to have Cena is at WrestleMania 34, and they literally don't care about anything else. They're literally trying to pound everything in. It really feels like a John Cena versus Braun Strowman type of match and main event a pay per view, not be the two hour crossover main event segment on a Raw. I'm just saying. Miz TV. My God, that was good. It was actually my favorite thing of the night. Congrats to the Miz. He put a daughter in Maurice. And why do I say he put a daughter in Maurice? Because he's a WWE wrestler. They usually make daughters just saying. He could have made a son. But let's be honest. He probably did not. But it's great. It's glorious. And I'm sure afterwards they celebrated with chocolate cake for everybody. Meaning mostly Maurice shoving it in her fucking face. But man, the promo work between Miz and Enzo was very good. Because it felt very real. And, you know, when Miz is calling out that Enzo reminds him of him in some ways. It's like, yeah, you know what? You're absolutely right. And you could see the connection there. You could see where this makes sense. You see Enzo... And you're like, you know, this guy is is unique, like he talked about. He actually has been able to get over, unlike most of the roster, and even people knowing and we're addressing it and talking about it, the fact he's a fucking jerk, and we do all this heel crap, including having him talk to, to Maurice and talking to, to the baby and talking about who's your daddy and talking all this other crap and talking about how the Miz is soft and people still like him. Crazy. When you're original and you try to entertain, you might actually do so. But the Miz TV segment, Miz was phenomenal on the mic. Once you got Enzo away from some of the catchphrase crap, he's actually kind of good when he wants to be. But the dynamics between these two here is kind of interesting because I don't know if this is where they were wanting to go right now. If they were just strictly using this as a um, Enzo's got a match against Neville at No Mercy. Or we were really trying to set the table for Enzo versus Miz. I kind of would be okay with that based off of what I saw in this segment. Uh, what I'm not okay with, or most of let me rephrase that, as you can see by the lack of level of effort in this review, because frankly this Raw really didn't deserve a whole lot of effort in this review, the eight-man tag. Weak-ass finish to Raw. I'm sorry, it just is. At this point in time, I don't know if I care about any of these teams. I most certainly don't care about these teams wrestling each other on Raw when in different configurations they've all wrestled so many freaking times. And I most certainly don't care about the thought of these four teams wrestling each other at the next pay-per-view. I'm just saying. It was funny because once again this week, the WWE blew their entire wad with Roman and Cena at the very beginning of the show. Like, literally, the formatting was the exact same. And you had Cena and Strowman, and it didn't even main event. Like, that's what's crazy about it. You didn't have Roman get involved with anything like that. And it didn't main event. Like, how crazy is that? Like, typically you would think, even if your show doesn't end until 11 Eastern or a little bit after with the overrun, you would actually want to build to your biggest and most important match of the night if you're going to have a match main event, have that be the main event. And Cena and Strowman was buried in the middle of the show. Ultimately, I guess, it doesn't matter. And my thought about this week's Raw, honestly, was that it largely didn't matter. It was a reminder of why, when they go somewhere to, like with Raw... The arena is half empty. All the people that want to bash on Roman, frankly, to a certain degree, all the people that want to bash on Cena, will start bashing Brock. He's the fucking champion. And he can't draw flies to horse shit right now, period. 